I am here with Rory from Dayseeker. How you doing, buddy? I'm very good, man. Uh, I pulled my back out though, like an old man. But, oh no. <laughs> uh, otherwise, otherwise, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing well. I, I was going to say, you know, now that you're a father, that uh, those type of things kind of happen. Pretty much, yeah. It, it definitely started with a. I think I injured it when I had a personal trainer like a year ago, I and mean, then now it's just really easy to like mess it up like uh, every once in a while but i'm i'm going to see a chiropractor later today so i'm hoping that that helps but we'll see gotcha um you know i was listening to the album today dark sun and uh i like listening all the way through on albums and i like on when you get spotify if you just put it on it just keeps going through your discography um because you can kind of get lost in things and i found myself like halfway through the last album and I was like holy oh, it's just it was a trip man and I gotta say um you know some people would say that you guys had such a huge shift in how the the music came out but I really you can almost feel the progression happening um back in that last album tell me like I know it wasn't because you like consciously like, we're gonna do this guys this is what we're sitting down to do like what was it like to to go a little bit push the 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 genre of metalcore to where it is uh i mean to be honest we started as like more of a metalcore band in our in like the beginning of our career and i think that was what we were passionate about writing at the time but around our third album we were still attempting to do that style of like riffs and breakdowns and, and a, a big definitive 50 50 split with screaming and singing and I think we just sort of took a step back after the third album and realized that most of us didn't even really listen to that genre <laughs> anymore and so it it felt like at times on 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 our third record that we were kind of like almost forcing it a bit because it's it's where we found minor notoriety is is in that heavier metal genre and we felt like we were going to be betraying old fans and we, we thought if we tried to go even remotely softer that all of our old fans would just be like you sell outs and uh and it's it's funny but but we realized too it was like the the rise in our popularity it was just it was so slow up until that point that we were like we're gonna like we will break up if by the time we get like there's no way we'll get popular and make money off this before we actually break up so we um, we, we did Sleep Talk, you know, our second to last album. And I think that was our first chance to like, well, let's, let's try something we, we actually want to do. And it'll definitely be different. Um, and I mean, the payoff was just huge. And then I think with Dark Sun, our, our newest album that we just kind of, we realized that we can get away with doing that and that people seem to enjoy it more than our older stuff. So I think we just leaned into that like 80s kind of vibe, but just with like really really set like pop structuring with the songs overall and um it feels nice man it, it does feel like our, our scene is a little bit more open to like music that's a little bit different nowadays so I'm I'm, I'm very thankful that they're they're receptive to it yeah it you know I I grew up in the time where like it was you know your verse chorus verse breakdown chorus and a song for all every single thing that came out it felt like and now to see and it wasn't like I, I was like the outcaster if I was wearing like um like a kill switch engaged shirt or something people are like oh look at this freaking metalhead you know crazy guy and now um and it was a very small population of people and now it seems like the the bands that were in that genre and uh, like the evolution of of the sound has become massive it, like you're the last tour that you guys went out with bad omens was sold out like before you even went on the road yeah tell, tell me about the what's it like to because you guys have been around since like 2014 that's when the first album came out and now to see where you're at in 2023 tell like what's different uh people care that's, <laughs> that's a big one um yeah it's a lot of uh i mean the beginning is just so much grinding but it, it felt like I don't know. I, I don't want to say like we just had major envy. I just I felt like at the time um, that we were starting, it's just a lot of our friends who are in bands um, 
like there was this band called at the skylines um this band called hardest um uh i just it felt like there were these bands where they like exploded onto our local scene and just found immediate success i think both of those bands they were just selling out local venue venues here in orange county called like chain reaction um i think they both got offers from roadrunner records at the time and it was just kind of like there was definitely like we were i think we were at it too for a couple of years in the beginning and these bands would be newer than us and then find this like meteoric rise to popularity and re really great touring opportunities so early on and it felt like it felt like in our earlier days we really had to fight to get like decent touring opportunities and if we were lucky we would go out maybe maybe twice a year and and usually um you know opening slot or second slot and, and playing for like 80 or 100 people if we were lucky and so it's it was very um it took a long, long time to get here, but it is very, it's very rewarding, I suppose. But it's still, it's funny that because it took so long to get here, it, uh, it's just, it's very surreal, sort of. Like, I, I sometimes don't really grasp that it seems like we have uh, somewhat of a name in our scene now. And that, I think when we did our headliner uh, last April, it was a really big eye opener of like, oh, like, there are people who want to come see us because I've, I've done supporting tours for bands who headline and they tank. And it was just like, it was horrific to see for the headlining band specifically. Like I was like, Oh, like it breaks my heart. And I couldn't imagine what that does to your ego to try and headline and, and only, you know, 50 people show up a night. Um, so I'm very, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really grateful that we, we are at this point in our career, but it's uh it's a trip sometimes, man. It, it really is strange to, to get used to that. It's, it's it's really cool to see the popularity of of your band specifically and and the the genre as a whole it seems like it's kind of taking over uh the sub pop culture right now you know even like spirit box is featured in like a, a netflix show like just a poster which people are pointing out which is really cool to see oh that's uh, all that yeah that's cool um and but let's talk about your headlining shows because these are and we'll get we'll talk about the album because um it it's a it's a very heavy thing while not being heavy emotionally and we'll, i want to talk about that eventually but right now i want to talk about your shows because like you said you have a headliner you did that last year and i saw a tweet that you said um you have it's crazy to think we have 2023 pretty much all booked up for tours um been announced on a couple of festivals um what's it what is your headlining show? Like when you put together your show right now, like what do you, what kind of experience are you trying to emote? Um, yeah, I think, I think we're trying to definitely make sure that our live shows are a little bit more than just uh, like we show up, play, and then like you go home. Like I really do. I feel like I definitely noticed a shift too. And like, our popularity and people wanting to see us live had a lot to do with uh I felt like the more open that I was on stage about like the content of the songs or or just me being open about my own emotions I realized seemed to hit a chord with a lot of people and what's funny is is there there's this band called Let Live um that was from our local scene um and they they, they found popularity and now they're now they've, they've kind of uh, went on to be like fever 333 which uh is, is oh different. sure yeah. yeah um and um but yeah their singer jason i saw i saw let live play a show out here in la man pro probably like right around when this band was starting and uh he uh he had a song that he had written about his mother and, and like the absence of his father and um he like <sighs> the guitar player was just kind of strumming like these really pretty kind of ambient chords and he he just talked about uh his experience with his mom growing up and I, I had like a rough idea of what the song was about before I saw them live and then hearing hearing him explain it in like really great detail um I was just kind of like oh wow like I like I didn't realize it was about that and then I think also setting me up for the context of the song uh right before they played it and then just seeing seeing the emotion when he was performing and then kind of connecting the dots with a lot of the lyrical content. It just really made me 
appreciate the performance more and it there, there was something that struck a nerve with me where I was like man that'd be like that'd be really cool to do live one day um and I think uh I think too it's just because like I mean I would say I guess more so men but typically just people even lately it's just like they it's like we're not encouraged to be open with our emotions and it's just better to like swallow things down so I I really these days um try and be like a mental health advocate that uh I just I see it with my friends and other people in my life too they just they kind of swallow their emotions and I I feel like one day they just kind of explode because they, they need to get it out and I'm I'm really lucky that I have songwriting as this sort of cathartic process to like get out a lot of the things that I'm feeling and I feel like uh yeah mo most uh most times we we play our sets I, I usually we have this song called drunk I, we play about my dad and I there's a kind of like a longer gap interlude before we play it and so I try and say something nice about him and it's it's funny because I I feel like we kind of get known now as like a band where if you come to see us there's like a a coin toss chance that you you might cry at the show because it's just very it's very sad but um I guess my hope you know in that is that you know they're crying good tears because uh they they connect or they relate to something and I I hope it you know just alleviates some pain that they might be feeling but we I, I think we, we try and make it a lot more of like a cathartic experience for for people who watch us live if if, if they connect to the music anyway uh, I w let's talk about the album then, because this ties directly into it. The first time that I listened to the album, I was like, this is amazing. What a what a trip, what a emotive album. And then I had read that it was you dedicated and wrote it about your father who recently passed away. And um, my dad passed away in September of 2021. And so. Wow. Sorry, man. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty much just. <laughs> Yeah, my dad was July of 2021, so pretty pretty much right there. Right, so to hear that then with the, the emotion and the context behind it, I was like the, I think I've read somewhere like Sad Core and also like, you know, the song that you have like crying while you're dancing. I was like sitting at my desk and I was like just devastated. And I, I, I haven't had that ability. I don't have the ability to write songs to get through my grief. So I have to rely on other people. And I want to know how you were able to take that grief, that pain, and uh, which is a hard and heavy emotion to navigate and how you're able to steer that into your, your creative energy. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, you know, I started writing songs when I was about 15 or 16. And, you know, that was, that was high school stuff. So it was, it was just like girls and, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh it just random things like that but I definitely did find that um at a really young age that if something was kind of keeping me up at night or like really difficult to swallow I, I could just write about it and if I could like finish like one cohesive song about a topic and kind of transform something really negative into something kind of positive um like in an artistic sense anyways like it made me feel like I could just breathe a little bit easier about it. And it was, it was a lot easier for me to accept. And that's, it's been kind of how it's been for my entire life or, you know, and like issues with my, cause my mother was a drug addict and just, you know, my, even when my dad was sick, when he was alive, it was just like the way I, I get through things. It's just, uh, if it has like a really heavy emotional weight and it impacts me really deeply, I, I just have to write about it. And I, I think, uh, I don't know. It was interesting because I, uh, his, I think my my dad was definitely alive. I think when we started working on like writing music for the album, and then he had passed, and then I had to write, um, like lyrics and melodies and everything for like these like ten or eleven songs, and uh, it's just uh, I feel like for me it was just a way to like keep my head down and just kind of try and work through it. You know, it was it was a way where I didn't have to like sit at home and, and just kind of think about it and dwell on it it was just kind of like how can I like how can I honor his memory and that you know there are like I definitely wrote about my dad being sick before but I, I haven't really I haven't really lost anybody that I was that close to in my life ever I, I had lost uh, distant cousins and um, people in my family that I knew and I loved um, and that I was sad that they were gone but not like a just like devastating 
but you know i mean losing your parents i think is, is probably one of the worst ones you can experience and i think uh i think it was just there was so much to say about it um because i we wrote neon grave first about my dad and i i assumed that i would be able to get like oh like that that'll be the dad song and then mm -hmm. i we finished it and then i was like there are there's like so many other stages um and experiences of grief that i'm going through i, I can't really get it all out in one song so um it is dedicated to my father. I, th I think there's there's like five written about him and then the other six um, just touch on different things that was going on. But yeah, I mean, you know, there was just songs about me feeling like I was communicating with him when I was asleep, when I was dreaming. And um, I don't know, and my, my dad, you know, was in, he was in the hospice for a couple of days before he died. And that was just like a really, that's, yeah, that's kind of more about uh, a song called Parallel. And that was like, I guess that's my only worry with the album sometimes like I'm really proud of it but I'm like damn this like is this too sad like <laughs> a little a little too hard you know I, I think consciously I'll be at a better place in my life in a couple of years when we work on our next album and I'm, I'm hoping like it'll still be like sad I'm just hoping it'll be more like light-hearted sad not just like devastating like lose your parents sad you know um, right but it is a yeah i mean it was it was it was it was good for me to have to to get through that um and i i do feel like this album specifically like i could tell there's some people who are like i don't get this album and i i could understand that like i just i could tell i was like i don't know if you've really had a great loss in your life um because i feel like i the people who really told me that this album struck a nerve with them were people who were like yeah i lost my dad to cancer or i also lost them but it was like they it was like the experience of uh, grieving from like losing someone they loved a lot. Like this album seemed to hit home with them in a particular way. It really did. And I, I still listen to it like once a week because it's just, it, it is a way to put in like, no one understands grief until you've been through it. And, and to, to hear it in the way that I like it, music just helps because you can cannot move around and it can, it can be defined any way you which way you want um but you you talk about the song parallel that one flows right into the the last song um hazel song so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that was a conscious decision to go like that um tell me about the writing for that song yeah um uh yeah afterglow um <laughs> for my daughter was uh it was a. Uh, it's funny because I had written the chords for that song, like the guitar chords and the melodies, like kind of a while ago. And it, it was actually, it was the second song that we worked on after Neon Grave being the first song that we wrote for the album. And then uh, it we had a lot of like the instrumentation there, but it's funny. It just kind of like some songs come together really easily. And it's like, it was the second song we started working on, but we just, a lot of songs when you write them or not they don't come easy and that that one did not come easy we had to kind of rewrite and re-tear and reconstruct that song like a couple of different times over to get it to where it is now and it ended up being actually like the very last song that we like finished writing and recording uh before the album was done but i think uh I just think because it was such a dark album i just wanted to make sure that it ended on a somewhat more positive note um and it was it was kind of like cool how it came out but it was i i had started writing parallel to um you know a couple months in the album writing process and it wasn't intentional but i realized that the that parallel and afterglow were in the same the same key like the same chords just um you know structured a bit differently so i i knew that i knew that like if we if we rang out on uh, parallel but it, it could trail into afterglow really well and I, I think it it just ended up working out where it was like you know probably the saddest song on the record and the you know the saddest experience of my life um just kind of bleeds into like the best experience of my life um and it I can't say it was like entirely intentional when I when we started writing the one about my daughter I wasn't like okay and then we need like a really horribly sad song you know, right <laughs> for it. you know it was just kind of like I just uh you know para it was I don't know why it was just important for me to kind of touch on my 
my experience with being in my dad in hospice care and that's kind of where parallel came from and then it just kind of worked out where I was like it's a little shorter track like it's not like it is a song but it's it's not like a you know like a classic three or four minutes it's like it's just a little over two minutes and I, I think it'll kind of cap off into like the end of the album really nicely so it was kind of a it was kind of an accident but it uh it came together like in a in a really a really cool way and and you know I think writing hap like happier songs like the one about my daughter is just not a not like a frequent thing that I do so I, I thought it would be cool to let the listener have like you know a little glimmer of hope <laughs> at the very end of the record you know Oh, it definitely stands out for me. I I, I love the, the way that everything flows together. And I, I read in an interview that you, you did, guys it, it took the, instead of going into the studio for like three or four weeks and just pounding out a record, it took multiple months to, to put it together. Um, is this going to be a, do you think this is the way that you would rather put together music or um, do you like the, the fast approach? No, it's... Uh... <laughs> Now every all the records before Sleep Talk, that's pretty much that's pretty much what we did. We would go in somewhere for like a month and it's um yeah, it's pretty brutal, man. Yeah, you'll walk in with a lot of ideas sometimes and I mean you're you're there like eight hours a day, usually about six days a week, just writing and recording. So it's it would be hard to not, you know, come out with ten or eleven songs at the end of a day. I just feel like it was a lot easier to be more um more creative and more interesting with the writing when you have it when you just don't feel like it's a job or you're like burnt out on it we really it we spaced out I think Dark Sun probably over the course of close to like a year um just going in a couple times a week when we weren't touring and kind of just seeing what would come out you know sometimes it'd be like oh I, I have this idea I wrote this thing other times we would go in um with nothing and uh that's that's which is funny because that, that's how without me came about we 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 wrote with this major pop producer um he worked with like panic at the disco and um just a, a bunch of other people and he came in it was kind of like a one-off like he just came in to write with us and I was like we have like singles it's like we don't really need like we don't need this guy or like it's not if, if it doesn't work out it's not a big deal and then we ended up writing we wrote this song without me in like I think like two or three hours and then we were like oh this is a single <laughs> like this, <laughs> this is really like it's a really it's a good song so it's uh but that's the thing is yeah if we had I think if we had locked ourselves in a studio for like a month it just I just don't think it would have come out the same and I, I think it's it's hard to be that unique and that interesting with your writing when you're being forced to do it for like a month and I think it too, there were times where we would like work on something and it'd be like, I think this is cool. And we would come back to it two to three months later and just realize it wasn't really that good. And versus if you're there for a month, it's just kind of like, go, go, go every day. And so I think we'll definitely continue to, to keep writing albums like this. It, it seems to get the best work out of us. Right on. All right. So that's the past. That's what's happened. Let's talk about what 2023 is going to have for you guys um like i said before you'll be on festival dates so we're gonna see a, another headlining tour um yeah we have a lot of have a lot of touring planned for this year we are going to australia at, at some point i can't say uh we're going to be to the uk very soon i can't say um and then we have a couple a uh, couple bigger U.S. tours. Specific, there's one specifically at the very end of this year. It's being planned out um, already, but that's a supporting tour. But those will be like, um, like two, two to six thousand cap rooms. Like it's, it's a bigger. Dang. Uh, it's, it's like it'll be like the biggest shows we've ever played. Um, but that, that's us supporting. That's, that's not us headlining. Um, and then, I think coming off of that, well, I think with all the touring we'll do this year and everything we'll have out, it'll be like a. I think that'll be the best setup to headline because we we do want a headline, but it's just the way this year kind of played out. We realized it's not going to happen this year. So I think the plan right now is for us to headline again in early uh, 2024, actually, of next year. And I think we'll be in a really good spot coming off of the uh, this uh, this tour we're doing at the end of this year because it'll we'll have exposure to like a lot of a lot of new people who might not have heard of our band. And I, I think it'll I think it'll just set us up for success to go out and do 
more like one or 2000 cap rooms on our own and, and hopefully, hopefully pull up bad omens, you know, and sell out the whole thing, but we'll, we'll see, you know, that'd be badass, dude. Well, thank you so much for your time today, man. And, uh, and to, to talk about things that are not just, you know, the bubble gum, what, what chords did you use for that song? I, I appreciate the, uh, the openness that you provide with your music. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's, um, like I said, it's important to me and it's, uh, I just, I feel like our, our world could benefit from people being more upfront with their emotions and what they're feeling. So I, I appreciate you for that. Thanks, man.